the uh, you okay? uh, yeah. again? No. second uh, meeting of the Committee of the Whole for Council Year 2013-14 to order. Uh, would you do the roll call, Mary? Ballinger? Here. Orange? Here. Carlson? Here. Jasper? Uh, excused. Okay. Here. Salmon. Excused. Here. Uh, he was just in the building a little while ago. Maybe he's still on his way. Brassard? Here. Lewandowski? Here. Manichek? Here. Pentacle? Here. Pino? Here. Here. Van Ashen? Here. Vanderweel? Here. Bercy? Present. Always. Mm -hmm. We have a quorum. Would you please uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? <clears throat> I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the February 6, 2013 meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from February 6th. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Next, we have a public forum on agenda items. Uh, anybody wish to be speak at the public forum? Dulcy, for the record, would you state your name and address, please? Dulcy Johnson, 1306 North 5th Street, Sheboygan. Thank you. You'll have three minutes. Thanks. <clears throat> um, the agenda for tonight includes a couple of items related to IT, so I thought it would be a good time to again express my frustration with the paperless council. Board Docs was presented as an opportunity for citizens who watch the cable, council meetings on cable to become better informed. The agenda documents were going to be displayed on a screen in the council chamber for everybody to see. I questioned how it was going to be possible to display the consent agenda, which sometimes numbers over 20 documents, so that citizens could read that in the one or two minutes that it takes the council to dispose of those documents. I was told it didn't really matter because the council had already, those items had already been dealt with. So what about documents that are referred to committees where if a person was interested in an issue, they would have time to call their alderman or go to a committee meeting? The answer to that was before board docs, citizens didn't have that information either, so it didn't matter. So how are you better informing the public when you don't share that information with them? Cable viewers have never seen a single agenda or document on this electronic system. <clears throat> when I was on the council for eight years, Mayor Susha read the summary of all documents on the council agenda. Now I know that's not going to happen, but perhaps the mayor could read the summaries of the referral documents so that people who might have an interest in a topic would know what was going on. I'm a conservationist, an avid recycler, and I support the idea of a paperless council, but to present it as a concept <clears throat> of a better way of informing the public is really disingenuous. Actually, it's a step backwards, because now, on controversial issues, citizens do not know how their aldermen voted. It took me six weeks to find out the vote on a particular issue going back to March. <clears throat> a person cannot possibly find the names of their aldermen to know how they voted because the information is displayed for such a short period of time and in such an order, it's, it's displayed by whoever pushes their button first and by the time you get yourself oriented to look at that, it's gone. In fact, sometimes the vote isn't displayed at all. <clears throat> now I know that council minutes are printed in the paper and they're available. But that's like looking for a needle in a haystack, even to someone who served eight years on the council because it's completely disoriented from the agenda. 
and it just takes a long time. And then people say, well, what about the county? Okay, two wrongs don't make a right. Oh, I'm sorry, I talked too fast. I mean, I didn't talk fast enough. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Dulce. Anybody else wish to be heard? Anybody else wish to be heard? We'll move on to the chairman's comments. Uh, I'm gonna go through this quickly because we, we wanna uh, move along as much as we can, but I just, for the newer aldermen, uh, kind of what is the Committee of the Whole? First of all, how does one become chairman of the Committee of the Whole? Well, I've, I believe this is my third year as, uh, as chairman of the Committee of the Whole, and the chairman of the Committee of the Whole at the organizational meeting of the council every year, I'm elected by my fellow alder persons to this position. And as I said, this is my third year, and uh, I consider it an honor, honor and a privilege to hold this position and conduct these meetings. And at the Committee of the Whole, we try to discuss items that, where we can spend a little more time on the item, and so we don't have to sp discuss those items uh, at the council meeting, perhaps spend some time at the council meeting, or at the Committee of the Whole meeting, go over, going, going over those items in detail. And we do vote at the Committee of the Whole, but our votes at the Committee of the Whole are just a recommendation to the full council for the next council meeting. So I believe we'll be voting on one, one item tonight and then there's a couple other ones that are just for discussion. But since I've been on the council uh, going on eight years now, the Committee of the Whole has always been a valuable tool for the council members to get together and discuss issues in, 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 a, in, more, in more detail and, uh, and then make recommendations to the council and therefore Many times the council meetings can be very long and it's difficult to spend a half hour or 45 minutes on one item. So that's kind of uh, w the reason for the Committee of the Whole. Uh, <clears throat> with the agenda, I had some uh, protocols and I just want to go over a few of them that I think are important. Uh, first of all, it's kind of important if you can get here a few minutes before the meeting starts. If you can't make it or you're going to be late, if you can call Mary. Mary Rager from the mayor's office or me or me, and let me know if you can't make it or, or, or are gonna be late. Uh, and, and please also remember that the committee of the whole needs a, mem uh, a minimum of nine older persons before we can conduct any business. And the last time, the, the first attempt at a meeting we had this year, we were one person short. I thought we had a quorum, but we didn't. Uh, and if at all possible, you know, if you, can, if you can call either Mary or myself so there's no unexcused absences. I would also ask that any electronic device uh, that's not being used during the meeting to be turned off and out of sight. Uh, and I also would appreciate it if you would review documents and be prepared to be act, an active participant in the discussions. Uh, if you wish to speak, uh, all of the meetings are gonna, uh, or most of the meetings are gonna be on television. If not live, they'll be recorded. So it'll, it'll be necessary for you to use your microphones. Uh, I'll try to keep the, uh, the, the meetings moving so that we're not here hour after hour, but I do wanna have a full discussion on, uh, on the items that are on the agenda. Uh, and then also for the new all persons benefit, the mayor is not a member of the Committee of the Whole. The mayor is welcome to attend the Committee of the Whole meetings, but would be seated in the public area. And if the mayor wishes to speak at a Committee of the Whole meeting, it's at the chairman's chairman's uh, uh, discretion. And, uh, and, and, and as we had tonight, we will have a public forum at all of the committee meetings on, uh, that, on agenda items. So I would appreciate if you could cooperate with some of these protocols because I think it'll make for an efficient running committee. Thank you. Any questions on those at all? Or on the committee of the whole? Okay, uh, next we're gonna move item number nine up ahead of the other two items, and that's the item for discussion and possible recommendation to the Common Council. And uh, item number nine is Common Council document number 4.4 from April 15, 2013, an RO by the city clerk submitting a communication from Alderman Jim Boren regarding the city of Sheboygan 2012 and 13 health insurance rates, and there was some attachments to that document. Uh, I believe, uh, yes, um, thank you, um, Older at this point, um, I would, uh, move to refer, uh, this information, uh, to the, uh, salary and grievance committee, 
uh, which will be better equipped to look at, the, at these uh, issues in more detail to actually frame what the issues are um, and explore uh, what uh, city health insurance Obviously, one can't just look at rates. One has to look at the entire picture. So in that respect, I would move uh, uh, for that referral. Second. We have a motion and a second uh, to refer this to salary and grievance. Uh, any discussion? Uh, under discussion, I'm going to uh, go over a few things, as this was my document originally, and then uh, we'll go from there with, with, with any discussion from the older persons. I received a, uh, a communication from the, uh, from the uh, HR department uh, indicating what the health insurance rates are for the city employees' uh, health insurance for 2012 and 2013. The single plan is $737 a month or $8,844 a month. The family plan for our city employees the premium is $1,731.40 uh, a month or $20,776.80. Uh, and I'll refer back to this later. I also had a communication from the HR department. The breakdown for uh, health insurance for our city employees is we have 145 employees that are in the single health insurance plan and we have 300 city employees that are in the family plan. And then also an attachment to the document was some information that I found uh, back a couple of months ago. I believe it was in the Milwaukee Journal, and that was some information, uh, national data, from the Kaiser Family Foundation and the Health and Research Educational Trust, an affiliate of the American Hospital Association, uh, and this, this Kaiser Family Foundation is a, I don't know if you'd call it a think tank or whatever, but they do, they do uh, information gathering on health insurance around the country, and it's my understanding that generally their statistics are pretty creditable. They found that the average national single plan in the United States <clears throat> was $5,615 a year. <clears throat> And as I mentioned before, the city of Sheboygan's single coverage is $8,844. So if you uh, take a look at those and, and subtract them, the, the single plan for the city of Sheboygan employees is $3,229 for for, per year for a single plan, and that is above what the national average is for a single plan. The average national family coverage premium for a year uh, is $15,745. The city of Sheboygan's family coverage premium for a year is $20,776.80. So again, if you take that city premium minus the, the, uh, the national average for the public sector, uh, I'm sorry, the private sector, you find that there's a difference of $5,031.80. Also, on a national basis, employers on average pay 82% of the single plans. Family plans, private employers nationally pay 72% of the premium. Uh, for the city of Sheboygan, uh, we pay 88% uh, of the premium, so the difference between the, the family plan for what we pay here in Sheboygan and the national average, uh, the city of Sheboygan again is 88%. The family, uh, the family plan national average that employers pay is 72%. So we are, we being the city, pay 16% more for a family plan than the national average. On a single plan, Sheboygan pays, on a single plan we pay 88%, and the single plan for the Private sector pays 82%, so for a single plan, the city of Sheboygan pays 6% more than the national average. Now, the, the above statistics are, were for, 200, for 2012, and it does not include deductibles, uh, co-pays, or out-of-pocket expenses. Then in April, uh, after I had submitted this document, I found some further information, and 
the source of this information was the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel article, uh, and the title of the article was 400,000 fewer Wisconsin workers get health insurance through their employer. And this article was in the Journal Sentinel on April 11, 2013. And this was the private sector Wisconsin health insurance. Uh, and this, these uh, averages that I'm going to report to you are from 2011 compared to the city of Sheboygan. And again, a single plan for the city of Sheboygan, $8,044, and that's for 2012-2013. Private sector in Wisconsin for a single plan was $5,414. That's an additional $3,430 per employee per year that we're paying for a single plan over and above the Wisconsin average. Family plan, again, the city of Sheboygan's premium was $20,776.80. Private sector in Wisconsin for a family plan is $15,024 for 2011. And that's a difference of $5,752.80 additional per employee per year that we're paying uh, over and above what the average is for a family plan in the private sector in the state of Wisconsin. Now, if we take a look, we go back to what I mentioned before, where we have 300 employees on the family plan. If you multiply the $5,752.80 by, by 300, that comes out to be $1,725,840. If you take the difference in the single plan of $3,430, and you multiply that by the 145 employees that have the single plan, that's $497,000, $497,350. If you add those together, we're currently paying, the city of Sheboygan is currently paying for health insurance $2,223,190 a year, over and above what uh, the, the uh, private sector is paying for their health insurance plans in Wisconsin. <clears throat> now, uh, before we get into discussion, I just want to throw out a couple things. Some options that you may want the Salary and Grievance Committee to take a look at, and there might be a lot of other ones, but I just want to go over a few possibilities. But before, I'm only going to make one, one editorial comment in this entire discussion, and that is the difference between what employees pay for health insurance in the private sector versus the public sector is what garbage fees are made of. Some possible options that you may want us to consider at salary and grievance. Number one, do nothing. Everything is okay as far as what we're doing with our employees' health insurance. That would be option number one. Option number two would be continue and extend the garbage fee for 2015 and beyond to continue partially fund this gap. Number three, redesign the health plan to make it cheaper for our employees and the taxpayer support. Now what I mean by redesign the health plan, uh, Act 10 was packed, passed a couple, a couple of, uh, of years ago and that said that uh, municipalities around the state of Wisconsin can redesign their health insurance plans. And for the bargaining units that we still have left, which are main, the bigger ones are fire and police, that is a uh, re the redesign of the health plan is non-negotiable in contracts. However, we cannot ask our bargaining units to pay more than the 12% that they're already paying. Uh, when it comes time for the next contracts in 14 and 15, I forgot which is which, but I think one becomes due in 14 and one in 15, at that time we would be able to negotiate higher participation by our bargaining units. Uh, we could expect our employees to pay a bigger premium share closer to what, this is number four, expect our employees to pay a bigger premium share closer to what the private sector pays. Uh, and now, again, the U.S. average for the private sector and a family plan, private employers are paying 22% of that, uh, I'm sorry, private employees and private companies in the USA are paying an average of 22% for their health insurance coverage versus the 12% that our city employees pay. Number five and the last one. 
explore, and the county is already working on this for the retirees, by the way, so uh, uh, ex explore the new federal exchanges, health healthcare exchanges, which are gonna go into effect the first of the year. And they fed, the, the federal health care exchanges are also referred to Obamacare. Uh, explore, explore those exchanges for 2014 and 15. Are the exchanges a better deal for our employees, both in what the coverages are going to offer, and more importantly, what the premium costs are gonna be for our city employees? So that would be just some options that I came up with. So uh, I'm done with, with presenting what I had to pre pre uh, present. And I'm just wondering if any of the aldermans, any of the older persons have anything they would like to comment on. Alderman Versi. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, this, this needs to be discussed at, in depth, both salary agreements and here. Um, some of the situations, some of the scenarios you put out are perfect scenarios to be looking at as far as uh, restructuring what the health insurance would look like. It's, it should be a combination of both restructuring and also premium share that the employee should be picking up. And that's one of the things that hopefully in salary grievance is discussed a lot more in depth than we can do anything here with. But um, these, these are issues that should be taken care of sooner than later because I, I believe October is when they set, we set the rates again. Am I, if I'm right, or is something like that. I was, we, I was part of that in the last, last year um, as far as setting the rates with UMR. Um, on top of that, it, it's just very important for us to look at that. The, the amount of money that we've spent, $2.6 million in the health premiums dollars of taxpayers' money, we need, maybe need to look a little bit better at working for our taxpayers and redesigning those plans and also doing the, the premium share a little bit higher than what we're paying. Um, comparing it to the private sector is a big difference. Obviously, I'm in the health insurance industry, but comparing it public to private is a big extreme, but even public to public, there are a lot of other play, public forums that are paying more than 12% in their health insurance. Um, municipalities in Wisconsin, there are several of them um, that are paying 15, 18%. I mean, it's not a huge jump from the 12 and percent that we're doing now, so I think that's something we need to look into. I'm doing 15, 18, going to 20 right off the bat might be a push, might be a too big of a jump, but I think 15, 18% would help offset a lot of those premiums. So um, wh whoever's on salary agreements, I would hope that they bring this up um, in, a, in a timely manner. Thank you. Salary and Grievance Committee is uh, Alderperson Donahue's chair, I'm vice chair, Alderman Vanderweele is on there, Alderman Hammond is on there, and then our new Alderperson, uh, Ty Dassler, am I correct? I think those are our members. And uh, maybe Alderperson Donahue is gonna mention this, but on, on uh, July 8th, she's invited our insurance broker to come in and speak with the Salary and Grievance Committee, and I was very happy to see that because we can talk about these and many other issues, so I'm, I'm glad to see that they're coming in. Any other comments? Okay, thank you, we'll move on. Uh, we will take a vote on that referral to salary and grievance. We have a motion and a second to refer to salary and grievance. I think we can probably do all eyes on this. All in favor of referring it to salary and grievance? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye, thank you. Next we'll go down, this item, these next two items are for discussion only. Uh, number seven is WSCS-TV and Sheboygan South SASD TV partnership. This is gonna be an informational pr presentation by Dave Augustine, our IT director, City of Sheboygan, WSCS-TV. Dave. presentation up. In case you're not familiar, Mike Trimberger, I'm the principal at South High School. Okay. We'd like to first of all thank you for inviting us to the meeting um, to present this opportunity that Mike and I have developed and are going to go on with our TV stations. So what the concept is, is right now we have 
now we have two TV stations in Sheboygan. South High has their program. WSCS has you know, our, our program. So there's an opportunity to form a partnership, and that's what Mike and I are working on, to form a partnership with the two of us so we can better utilize our resources and better cover events in the city. Um, and going on with that, that's kind of what this first um, slide represents is working together. So it's actually going to be a partnership of WSCS, Sheboygan South, and the UW as well. Uh, our current structure, again, Sheboygan has two TV stations, WSCS and Sheboygan South, um, SASD TV. There's no real coordination between programming activities, meaning there may be some events where both of us are there covering it, and then which leaves other events that aren't being covered. Um, we have redundant services, um, services to the community, our equipment purchases and programming, there's two sets of everything. So it's like we're doubling up, um, which you know obviously is in the days of our you know shrinking budgets and more demand to be more efficient. Um, it leads us to think outside the box and come up with more creative ways. So how does this look? Uh, and we use a spring sports baseball right now, but another really good example is during uh, basketball season. Uh, this year in our media press box, we would have WSCS and SASD TV broadcasting the same, t same game on, on, on TV, leaving Plymouth's, Sheboygan Falls, other community events uncovered. Uh, and really, truly, it was a lack of communication, a lack of resources, and really, uh, I think, a lack of uh, just connection between, hey, are we doing this to broadcast to Sheboygan Area School District? Are we broadcasting this for Sheboygan community? Or is this really about trying to cover all the great things that are happening in Sheboygan uh, at any given night? So you can see in the illustration, you know, like at one point there's two, both of us covering, you know, the Sheboygan South baseball, but yet Sheboygan North could be having an exciting game or a year or even out in Plymouth and they're not being covered. So that's what this illustration is. Again, we have kind of talked about the public sector. You know, we've seen decreasing budgets, increased public scrutiny of tax dollars, how they're being used. Um, we've seen reductions in staff, increased accountability, as well as increased operational costs. And obviously with two TV stations, that's twice the cost, you know, because both are working independently of each other. So again, we can't survive on this model of that's the way we've always done it. Um, that just doesn't work anymore. We have to think outside the box. Um, we can't continue to do, we can't continue to do the way, you know, we continue to do things and we can't cut our way to success either. So this is where our plan is being creative. And, you know, just listening to the session before this healthcare, all of our public sectors are, are getting the crunch. So how do we work smarter, not harder? And that's really, as you see the stool up here, it's a three legged collaboration between the Sheboygan Area School District, between the Sheboygan WSCS, mm -hmm. and the UW Center. And what we're trying to do is actually enhance services to our community, uh, educate our students better, give them authentic learning opportunities, and actually do it at a reduced cost, which, you know, if we do this right, a symbiotic relationship means all members of the organization truly benefit from this. And, and that's kind of one of the exciting things are, as I talked to Dave and as we, uh, worked with uh, Jackie uh, Joseph Silverstein on at the center. This really started to come together as something that truly we could uh, could work and really could be a positive for everybody. So, what are we talking about? What is the three-legged stool? Well, we know each leg is just as important as, as the next. So, the first leg is the University of Wisconsin Center. What are they going to do for WSCS SASD? Well, first, we need to have a adjunct professor teaching courses uh, at South High School. And this adjunct professor is also currently a WSCS employee. And what they do is that adjunct professor, WSCS employee, comes to South and teaches broadcasting class that we currently offer at South High to South High students. Students get credit for completion of the course. They get college credit. They also get high school credit. It's called dual credit, meaning 
as you're going through, you get your, your credits that you need for graduation, but you also, when you're all said and done, uh, one class will be worth one college credit at anywhere in the UW system, the other one will be worth three that we're working with Jack, Jackie on. But how does that benefit the center? First of all, uh, in our broadcasting class right now, we have some of our top end students, some of our valedictorians, potential valedictorians in these classes. They're going to be using some of the center resources. They'll be using some of the uh, broadcasting editing uh, equipment out at uh, WSCS studio. Uh, and they, they see what the center offers. They get to have college level professors teaching the classes. Uh, and truly it's a recruitment tool for the center. It's, uh, it's enrollment, increased enrollment. And we're also looking at the opportunity of, if we're offering a class, a college class at South High, can college students also take it? So like a collaboration where we're actually offering more classes to our community. From a WSCS standpoint, WSCS will agree to have a WSC employee teach the class and we'll use actual broadcast materials. The benefits by this is with the collaboration, once the students get more up to speed past their classes, um, they can be included in camera operations and editing for the TV station. So the win-win here is we can use students to help our production output. Um, our camera operators are starting to get up there in age, so to speak. And um, this will be a way to help supplement the you know resources that we have and work together. Now this isn't the means to phase out all of our camera operators by any means, but at least this is a way to give the kids experience and we can expand our capabilities without adding costs for um, people. Um, we'll also give the kids real true life experience in the, the materials. Instead of just having a school project, you did this, okay. It's done here, they'll be actually doing work right for the TV station where people actually get to see, like right now we're on TV you know, and they can do productions, they can put on cover events um, with supervision and all the other legalities and coverage involved as well, but it'll be a good experience for that. So the other benefit to it is we can do a coordination of programming efforts where it's all tied together so we can become more sister stations and coordinate our programming activities, you know, and working together. Um, better event coverage, um, as well as more public awareness um, because of, through the interest it's in people watching. And what does this mean for South High and Sheboygan Area School District? Uh, first, our district will agree to pay youth options, which is uh, a state guaranteed program for students that want to take college classes, district pays for. So we're gonna pay that to the center. We also compensate the WSCS employee for their time, uh, the extra coverage things that they have to do. But you know, as Dave, uh, Dave mentioned, some of the really meat on the bones here is for our students. First of all, students relieve, uh, receive high level instruction. They're getting instruction uh, from actually one of your cameramen at WSCS that is a college instructor. Uh, does a great job. Uh, he's very engaging. The kids are gonna, gonna love him. Um, students, like I said earlier, they get college credit. So you're sitting in a high school class, but you're getting college credit. We know what college credits go for these days. Uh, it's, it's a way to reduce the, the cost of post-secondary for some of our students. Uh, the curriculum, you hear a lot about authentic learning. You, as I think back to high school, you, we had homework assignments that we did. It's a lot more authentic if what I'm working on here becomes a commercial on TV, you know, and I can show my friends, hey, that's, you know, I got a B plus in that one, see where I messed this part up. Those are the part of things that mm -hmm. we can do, and the homework becomes things that actually are produced for WSCS, so it's it's that collaboration of if we by working together we're actually pooling our resources to have a better product for Sheboygan Area School District, a better product for WSCS, and, and truly uh, something that's beneficial to the center. Uh, and you know the last piece I want to talk about too is is in education we're talking a lot about engagement. We want to find ways to get kids hooked into why school is important. This is one of those things that we can get kids excited about learning because. Hey, you know, everybody likes to be on TV, so. Based on what we had talked about, if you take our first illustration now, looking at the new big picture with the scenario we're gonna be moving towards, you can see we have more events covered. 
you know, more things we can show, more, more events that people can watch. Now we can send a, a team out to cover the Sheboygan South baseball game. North may be playing, we can cover them, or possibly even Plymouth, we can cover them as well and get it out there and being you know, shown, or we can, we can expand our audience to more of the county rather than just the city. Again, um, in doing this, there's gonna be some metrics that we're gonna to use to measure our success. Um, obviously, we're gonna start with the number of students enrolled in the broadcasting class. So we'll, if the enrollment goes up, you know, that'll be one of our benchmarks. Um, along with the students, um, it isn't gonna be like, okay, here's a class that somebody's gonna take off as a blow-off class. There's gonna be expectations set, there's gonna be, you know, assignments, expectations, requirements met, and if they aren't cutting it, they're gonna get a grade and it's gonna be, you know, so it isn't gonna be like a blow off class where, you know, like a seventh hour study hall used to be. This is going to be, you know, real down to the mm -hmm. earth. Um, this is a college level class yep. that'll be taken. So, yep. so there's gonna be expectations held by the UW system that students will have to attain to, to actually get credit mm -hmm. for these. The other point just is, um, yeah. you know, once we coordinate our programming efforts, there's gonna be new programs on WSCS as well as SASD TV. You know, so it's there'd be like sister stations where we can cover multiple things and new new types of programming to expand. And one of the things I learned from just starting this conversation with, with Dave is some of the places that WSCS is going with uh, live TV such as this, uh, some of the uh, wireless cameras, uh, there's a lot of things that I think our community could really benefit by seeing on TV. But in some cases, uh, we don't have TVs either turning to the stations or we don't have people interested. When we have multiple students building things, you're gonna have parents interested in what's going on and, and maybe catching a couple of these sessions, doing some of those things, knowing that, hey, our lo local cable access is really a viable place to, to get entertainment or get news. Uh, and, and those are some of the things, as we look at outcomes, it's, are we getting more viewers? Are, are, is our community getting reached by this source? We pay a lot of money, both, both Sheboygan Area School District and WSCS, to, uh, to have the equipment. Why don't we share the equipment and actually just re reach a broader range of, uh, of our citizens? And, and truly, as we said here, at, at the very worst, we're budget neutral. This isn't costing anybody any more money uh, and it's uh, in some cases we're actually could make an argument that we'll be saving money by doing this. The other thing we're building into this, you know, with our annual reviews or our reality checks, so to speak, is there's going to be no additional cost to really do this. So we'll do, you know, our, our regular reviews and we may come to the point of, you know, this isn't working. So it isn't going to be anything really lost. So there will be, you know, it isn't like we're going to go if, you know, if it isn't working, we're going to, you know, step back and realize as well, so uh, as far as that goes. But I don't really see any problems. I see no. this being a win-win. And the last piece is, you know, I, I think the more we can have government entities working together to collaborate, is it's good for our taxpayers, it's good for us, it's good for our community. Uh, you know, I see avenues where we have students taking marketing classes. How can I have some of those marketing students work on commercials that work with the video production. There's endless numbers of ways of, of creating more of that authentic learning as we talk about um, that can be beneficial to, uh, to the city of Sheboygan and Sheboygan County truly as a, uh, as a whole. And, and truly it's, it's that piece of increasing some of that experiential learning in our community that'll be a real positive to, uh, to this partnership. At this time, we will open it up to questions, if you have any. Any questions? All of University? Thank you. Does North High not have any broadcasting class any longer? Uh, they have a radio broadcasting. Uh, over at South High, we have all the video broadcasting. But we will uh, allow people from North come over to South, across the river. And then adding and, on. Uh, and actually, mm -hmm. we also, uh, this two years ago, we had somebody from Howard's Grove. We do allow it. We're the only school in this area that actually has a video broadcasting studio in our, uh, uh, in our school. And due to retirements, this has been a, a real viable option that we can look at a collaboration. Mm -hmm. The other thing with that, with North, they have a radio piece of the broadcasting. So we want to take baby steps towards all of this. And when this works, there's no reason why we couldn't bring in North with the radio and then pipe in North's 
radio signal over instead of you know other music that we play now currently. So I see this really growing. And then the follow-up was um, with the increased um, students that are going to be doing for college credit, SESD is going to continue pay. I mean, increase in credits, college credits means increase in funding to pay for those credits, and they understand it's it could be a huge increase. Uh, the way it actually comes out, if you talk about having a full-time employee compared to an adjunct professor that we actually contract services for the district, even paying for those credits would be neutral at best, if not a cost savings. If we start getting up to 20, 30 students, then we'll have to, to, to maybe set a cap on how many students can be in this class, but truly the state of Wisconsin doesn't allow us to put any caps on youth options. If, if it's something that we've, we, we offer, uh, it's, it's, you know, I think it's a great way to market uh, some of the strengths of public education. You know, come and get college credit while you get high school credit. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Alderman Lewandowski. I actually got two questions. First one is, how soon would you be able to start this class? And the second one is, if it's going to be for college level credit, is that going to mean that it's going to be only for juniors and seniors, or would it also be for freshmen and sophomores? Uh, well, first of all, we're hoping September 1st to be launching this. So uh, I've talked to some of the students that are enrolled in this class for next year and told them how we're looking at doing this. So between Dave, uh, some of the employees, WSCS in, in, uh, in Sheboygan Area School District, with Jackie, uh, Joseph uh, Silverstein, getting the credits involved, we think we can get this all done by September 1st. So we're hoping that happens. Uh, I'm sorry, Scott, what was the second part of your question? What uh, grade level students can take? Grade level. Uh, it'll be open. The, the entry level class will actually be open to freshmen okay, uh, through senior. Now, truthfully, freshmen schedules are usually so locked up they can't take classes like broadcasting because they're stuck with the core areas. Uh, I see more sophomore, junior, seniors taking this class. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, agenda item number eight, and that is City of Sheboygan Information Technology Strategic Plan informational presentation by Dave Augustine, IT Director, City of Sheboygan, WSCS-TV. Dave? Thank you. A while ago, I had a conversation with Jim Lamodio about we should do a review on you know, our whole systems and processes and the computer systems we have for the city because there was definitely some noticeable shortfalls. With that, you know, it was always brought around that the AS400 is old, it's obsolete. Um, you know, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? So I said I would do a review and come up with some recommendations, which then I've turned into a plan. And this summarized presentation is what I've come up with. So what have we done so far? Uh, we've interviewed, I've interviewed or we've interviewed departments on their IT or computing systems that they have. We've reviewed the information they currently own. In other words, what are they responsible for putting in? What other information do they need access to? You know purchase orders or, you know, Spillman, they need data or whatever. So what information do they rely on from other departments? Um, we've identified issues regarding, you know, IT systems and overall processes, and we've actually started to imp implement some of the plan already. So that's what's been done so far. Preliminary findings. Again, I know this is small, so I'll cover them. Um, basically, our information is held in multiple places that we have right now. We have our AS400 legacy system. There's Munis, we have Market Drive, there's Spillman, there's data over at the county, there's things in spreadsheets, scratch paper, people's heads, et cetera. And our information is all over the place in many locations. It's not connected, nor is it easy to connect to, and there's no single entry point, and it's like you don't know where to go to get the information. The same information exists in different formats. <coughs> I may have a set of data sitting in Market Drive, but yet in Munis, it's a different set, but it's the same data and we're maintaining it in two spots. So you go, which one is correct? Our equipment is getting old with our PCs. 
our servers. Uh, people are not aware of what information is really available to them. They said, boy, I'd like to get that. I know I put it in, but how do I get it out? Where can I go? Likewise, they are, uh, what tools are available to me? You know, can I use Excel? What can I use to get it? What program can I use? There's lots of paper generated. We actually take printer, we actually take reports, print them off, get the information keyed into another system, get the information there and take that and keyed into a third system until we finally get the results. So there's lots of hopping around. Um, our systems are run on exceptions versus what's our process. In other words, well, if it's this, oh, we gotta do that. If it's this, we gotta do this. If it's this, we gotta do that. So they get so complicated and try and make them consistent. Spreadsheets are used as workarounds. If the system can't do what they want, then there's multiple data in spreadsheets and they start using that, so we lose some of our integrity of our information. Difficult to put information um, from multiple systems together. Again, that's making, you know, joining our market drive data with our, maybe our parcel data from the county to um, Spillman parcels, you know, with, with crime and linking that all together. Uh, lack of standard operating procedures. Knowledge transfer always doesn't happen. Somebody may leave, okay, how do they do that? It's all in people's heads. We need standard operating procedures. Communication is not always done, and if it is, is it's manually. People don't know why they do things. I mean, just for example, let's say there's a button, every time it turns red, you push it. You know, I keep pushing the button, but they don't know why they're pushing it, how it infects the big picture. Uh, training and orientations aren't always done. It's just like, um, here you go, have at it, have a good time. I know when I started, uh, I was showing my office, here you go. And I had an envelope on my chair with my ID and password, and that's how I got started, so. <laughs> um, many one-off programs, and IT is not always consulted with, you know, when, when systems are purchased. Now, I'm not trying to say IT is a dictatorship or a kingdom, but we do have the ability to help integrate things so we don't get, you know, somebody buys a software now they want to bring it into the payroll system. How do you do it? Well, this product that we had already would have done it already. So, and it takes a long time to get things done. The whole of our plan, our goals and requirements is we want to become more efficient, effective, and reduce cost. That's a common theme across everybody. We want to utilize our current investments. Let's use the things that we've purchased. That's why we bought them. We want easy access from anywhere, meaning out in the field. You know, if I have an iPad or a notebook or a Chromebook or a PC, I want to be able to get at my information. Access information from multiple systems. I don't want to have to jump around. Let me go into a portal or a system and let me pull the information I need. We want to go as paperless as possible. We also want to improve our citizen interaction from our website. Why couldn't a citizen you know, apply for building permits and licenses right online on our website? Could they pay their taxes on the website? Can they submit a question on the website? Can they you know, more interact and make it more self-service and easier for them? Uh, we also want to utilize our dashboards and work center-based things. In other words, here's my work for the day or if things come in, I can look at it and work on them. And then the last thing on this slide is roles and relationships, which is a, another slide I want to show you once I find it. Doo -doo -doo. City outflow, here it is. This is it. Okay, what I developed here is an example of a relationship of how our departments can work together, of the whole process flow in the city. Again, this is something I put together. Um, we have up at the top, you know, our city development and our outside factors, the public, you know, what's going on. So think of our city development and building inspection as kind of a marketing and sales. How can we promote the city and bring other programs in? Working on all of those, we can transition that to what we call support or our main engine, which is the centerpiece. Where we have, you know, we have police, fire, building inspection, municipal services, engineering, the clerks. This is where, you know, our support services, our transactional data and access to this as far as the workhorse of the city, 
where all this information comes through. And then that's turned into, you know, services, which then the assessors through special assessments, municipal court through fines, you know, other fines were financed, collects that turns into revenue. Over on this side, I'm just gonna move over. We have our common council. Common council should be giving us high level governance. Give us the plan, the high plan, and let's execute it. The attorney's office, are we dotting our I's and crossing, crossing our T's? You know, do we have legal integrity in place? Our supply chain, does everybody need the materials that they require to, to do their operations? Human resources, set the policies and let's get the resources in to do the work. IT, help automate electronic workflows. Finance, do the numbers add up and then input from the public and other outside sources like the county, the state, federal regulations, whichever, which is all outside um, influences on our core engine or process. When we get down towards the bottom, we take this information and then we can make uh, information out of it. We can build a history for reporting and easy access as well as we need to have quality in our systems with quality insurance. Um, that's where the standard operating procedures come in, our workflows and processes. We train our staff, orientations. We come up with our scorecards and metrics, kind of like we did for WSCS in our partnership with Sheboygan South. What are the metrics that we can measure? We manage things by project management, process management, change management. We build in quality, <coughs> design it, build it, staff it according. In other words, no wags. and then communication, both vertical and horizontal. So this is uh, something that I had put together that I wanted to share with you as well. <laughs> so. Moving on. Where's my mouse, there's my mouse. Recommendations. We need to again, continue to review and update our workflows. Departmental, between departments, what are the business functions of each of the departments? In other words, public works, they're more of a job shop or a work order based environment where parks may be a hospitality. You know, people want to reserve park sites, you know, what's all involved with them. Again, continue to develop standard operating procedures. We want to develop an employee orientation system. Uh, we want to classify each of the types of job descriptions we have, identify what the training needs are, what equipment, what programs do they need and then schedule those training and orientations when people start. Um, we wanna to continue to document our processes again to get the big picture. Um, again, departments to share information with each other, consult with IT regarding software so we can keep it all consolidated and coordinated, and then start equipment replacements on our life cycle. And again, I wanna show you an illustration again of a process review that I had put together. Here again, um, high level picture, this would be what I put together for building inspection. You know, with all the things that are, or excuse me, this is streets and repair, public works, not building inspection. I'm sorry, I got one for them too. But basically it steps through the whole process of where all the other departments and all the other functions work with each other. You know, from a work orders come in to evaluate it. Do we have the right resources? Do we have the right materials? If we have shortages, we order it, feeds it back to the general ledger, we execute the job, um, we complete the work. And what's really neat about this is this diagram we put together, we just had a demo on Munis work orders on some needs for public works and the demonstration of their software of what it does just about mirrored what this diagram is. So. It's a good template to match, you know, what our software needs are to what our processes are versus, you know, let's get a software and try and make it. So we need to know what it is we're shopping for. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Basically there's two paths, our infrastructure path and our applications path. And I'm just gonna go through a high level summary of what our each are and to keep it simple. 
2011, when I first came, um, there's some stuff we did right away. Um, we put in wireless here at the city. Uh, we put in wireless at Maywood, um, the whole Spillman implementation. Uh, we moved to a new crime system, so we had to get that all up and running to work with the county as well as the other agencies. Uh, we increased our internet ex um, connection here at no cost. We updated our network here at, at the Sheboygan PD to work with their phone system better. That was all things that we did. We eliminated our backup AS400 since we were no longer using our existing crime system. That saved us $20,000 a year, yearly. Um, we added a number of servers to our virtual environment at no cost because we had plenty of capacity. And what a virtual environment is, is think of a big box or a big server with memory and disk and whatever thing. You can chop that up into little servers using the same resources without having to buy a separate server for each um, for each um, server type, so that way then you don't have maintenance on each piece, it's just one piece of equipment. And we updated service agreements with the PDs that we, we, we support, Kohler, Sheboygan Falls, and Plymouth. So we have a yearly agreement for each agency for IT hosting for services. 2012, we relocated the MEG unit where they could save money to a county facility, and that was no cost to us. Uh, again, we had to increase our virtual server capacity so we could add more and consolidate our servers onto our virtual environment. Our whole network had to be upgraded, so we accomplished that. We also now had, or we also put in iPad and smartphone support so people could get their emails and calendar for Outlook on their iPads. Um, we consolidation of equipment, we retired old servers, moved them onto our new environment and consolidated. Maywood connection, we had to convert to broadband to get them off the wireless mesh, which we have. Our, our PD agencies as well, we have what we call, I don't know if you've ever heard, is the wireless mesh. It's a proprietary <coughs> ring of wireless network connection, and that's getting old. And when it gets below five degrees, it doesn't work anymore, so then people don't get connected and they get upset, so we had to come up with a new way to do that. Uh, we put in wireless at the senior center, public service we put wireless in. We connected wastewater directly to us where we're starting to integrate our systems and have them talk directly to each other. And then we equipped the conference rooms with monitors so that way presentations like this can be done. 2013, we completed the fiber installation, which gives us high speed between our, our, our core locations, which means the servers that were located at each of these places can be brought back here to City Hall consolidated and eliminated so we don't have less hardware, less things to go wrong, less maintenance. We had to replace our storage capacity. So we did that um, in 2013. We upgraded our city internet connection <coughs> to, with part of the fiber connection, so <coughs> connection for our squads to connect to. Um, wastewater was upgraded with that as well. Um, what was neat about that is we worked with the whole fiber installation and then working with the broadband carrier, we let the same contractor do the work, which really cut down in our installation costs. Again, we keep consolidating our servers and eliminating physical servers. We're going to be combining the existing two AS400s we have left into one, which will be a savings of $4,000 a year in maintenance. Uh, we, wanna, we wanna get rid of the mesh, obviously, and the life, and then we wanna continue to evaluate cloud solutions for email web you know, and other types of hosting things, um, technologies. In other words, instead of having it storing in our data center, can we store it somewhere in the cloud? And then continue to leverage our communication technologies. Over at the PD, we have a phone system that we are now looking to expand across the city so we can eliminate centrics and consolidate. Going forward, 2014 and 2016, our plans are is to convert our remaining sites to broadband, which is pretty much done. The only one left is Senior Center, so we're ahead on that. So that'll be the end of the wireless mesh. We want to have a backup internet connection at the PD for failover. We want to eliminate our remaining AS400s, which is then will be a $6,000 additional yearly um, savings, and then upgrade our infrastructure. And again, continue to evaluate. Applications. Again, the same type of a path in 2011. We developed the whole citizen inquiry thing where people can put, submit um, questions or 
concerns on the website and then we keep track of them and they don't fall through the cracks. We had additional capability to the AS400 with some of our programs for email and PDF capability for printing and what that basically does is that allowed us to take building inspection and put them on a paperless system so they don't have to print paper anymore except what's going to the customer. Everything else is now paperless. We put in board docs. We reviewed our help desk process. Um, we established a help desk process um, where people can support their, support their uh, requests online. We, we, the whole city website was redone and that was done through with Chad Talashek's help through grants that he got so our whole city website was done. We provided Spillman project management as well as we did IT process improvement where now we can image PCs make them the same remote control standards. We made a database to inventory everything, so it's more automated. 2012, again, smartphone and iPad support we continued. We created a PD intranet site for the police department. And basically what happened there is we trained them on the tool, set up a group, and we turned them loose and they're building their own intranet site where they're actually taking it and growing it and they're doing a real good job on that. Again, BI went completely paperless. We did for online timesheets, we wrote a prototype program just to prove that online timesheets could be done and feed our actual pay payroll system as a template. Spillman data extracts, we built a data warehouse of Spillman data that the PD can use for knowledge information management to graph trends, make decisions, do crime analysis, and then we started looking at Munis payroll to implement that. 2013, um, as of our first payroll in July, that will be running live on the new Munis payroll system, where we have online timesheets. Um, we'll be using the tool that we purchased, and the cost to carry out that implementation was, that was the cap that we went through from the council would be 50,000 max it was and we haven't even come close to that to spend that. Public Works put in facilities map and that's a tool that they can take all of their um, inventory of their sewers, manhole covers, whatever, and place it on a map for mapping. We also want to look at Munis financials and the whole purchasing and permits to see, to verify, you know, are we using them as efficiently as we can. In fact, on Monday and Tuesday of next week, we have the whole Munis permits inspections assessment coming up. So these are modules that we already own, that we have, in, well, financials and supply chain we have implemented, we want to implement permits. Market drive, we're finally doing the cut over to that. Um, they're doing modeling this September. We get training on that, so we'll actually be using market drive and be off the AS400 system. We're going to be doing a bo uh, board docs professional upgrade where the voting Meeting minutes can be typed right in. Um, you guys will be able to submit documents right to agenda items online. I'm working with the clerk, um, Sue Richards on that. As well as then we want to look at, look at clerk licenses and a whole workflow engine. And then for the future, again, we want to keep that whole department portal thing alive where go to one spot, <coughs> what's my work for today or one place for information. Look at the cashiering modules inventory and job costing for public works, work orders for public works, uh, parking tickets, animal licenses, the whole citizen self-serve, and any other custom applications we have to develop as well as then by then sunset our AS400 legacy applications. Now when I put this together, this was a while ago and I'm presenting it now, so those 2014-2016 may shift as we go but I just wanted to put a, you know, put a stake in the ground. And these costs that I received, most of them were based on Munis quotes I had because that's where we had originally made our investment in. So my plan is to first look at Munis and if that doesn't work, let's go to a different source if it's there. If not, we'll write something. So the general steps, all departments, we want to continue to review and update our workflows. You know, department orientations with staff. HR to partner with departments, so HR to work with departments so we can get these updated and these orientations set. 
and then follow our technology path where we've already started to replace our PC fleet and are working on that where we do X amount every year to keep them updated and up refreshed. Can it be done? Yes, it can. Uh, we're all need to going to participate. We all need to work together. We need to look at the big picture, but take the baby steps, break down the silos, and it's time to move the cheese. I don't know if you've ever read the book, it's time to move the cheese. So, in other words, we can't keep going because that's the way we've always done it. <laughs> it was kind of fast and high level. Um, any questions? Now I had some detailed diagrams as well. What I'll do is I'll email this to all of you so you can review it as well as the WSCS presentation. I'll email it to all of you. But I just wanted to give you a picture of where we're going and you know some of the decisions that we are making while we're doing it. So you've got some reasoning behind it. Uh, Dave, I'll get the ball rolling on questions. Uh, two or three years ago, I, I took a tour of the, uh, with some other city officials of the uh, DPW uh, maintenance department in Fond du Lac. Mm -hmm. And I believe they do the maintenance for their DPW of vehicles. They do the transit maintenance there. And I believe they do the police and the fire engines also. So they do a whole lot. And, and I never thought to ask Dave this question. I don't know if Joe did either. But in Fond du Lac, at the end of the year, if they want to know how many transmissions they bought for garbage trucks, they push a button and they got that cost center. And every nut and bolt that goes out of that department for maintenance is categorized in, uh, for either fire trucks or transit whatever, or DPW vehicles. Has Dave requested that capability or do we do that yet in Sheboygan? I believe that's a work in progress. I know he has expressed interest in how to track it, but we don't have the tools really to do it yet. Okay. And part of the whole work order program that Munis has in inventory that would give them the capability to do that okay. for maintenance, regular maintenance. They can, their whole fleet, when it's time to do an oil change, they can schedule that to, you know, however you want to break it down as far as a fixed asset. I mean, you can break an engine into multiple parts, you know, how far you want to go, but that's something we definitely want to look at. Right now we have a cost system, job costing system on the 400 that was home written and it definitely needs a facelift. And one other thing, uh, uh, Mrs. Johnson had some concerns about board docs, a number of concerns, I think you've heard them. Uh, are we kind of stuck with what we've got with board docs or are there other enhancements to deal with some of her concerns? And, I, and I've heard not only from Mrs. Johnson but even some of my constituents that watch on TV and I think you know, we, have better, we probably have better viewership, viewer, viewership than Monday Night Football. So there are a lot of people out there watching and I get complaints at church, people will say, well, I can't see how you voted on that, Alderman Bourne, so I tell them. But you know, are, are there any things that, things that we can do to make it more viewer friendly and address some of the concerns that she has? Well, with the newer version, <clears throat> The voting, right now we use two softwares, the whole board docs, and then she's flipping through the voting software. And it's to keep up, it's click, click, it's up and it's off. Where the new version will actually run the meeting through the agenda, so it'll go step by step, and when it's time to open, she'll open the votes, that's where we have to look at devices. It'll then, everybody will vote, and then it'll come up more in a more user-friendly format. And that's what uh, Clerk Richards and I are working on right now. Is there any possibility that that's another thing that somebody brought up to me is why can't it be in alphabetical order? Now it comes up, I think, in the order that we vote. It comes up in threes, twos, and ones where three is against, two is abstain, and one is four. That's the order it comes up in. And yes, the new version, it will come up alphabetically. Okay, good. We've already done the demos on that. And the parts we're at right now is basically we need to run through mock council to perfect the process. Good. A lot of that is going to depend upon uh, Sue Richards because of her schedule for that. I've been working with her to try and schedule time to get that. I mean, we have it set up. We just have to run it through and get it. So I'm hoping to get it late summer or fall. Any other questions? Thank you, David. Okay, thank you. Next on the agenda, we have the next meeting date. Uh, tentatively, you can put down July 10th, which I also think is a Wednesday, 
And that, I have to work out the details with Mr. Amodio, but that is going to probably be on the 2014 budget. The budget is going to be going to council and then the various committees on July 15th, I believe it is. So I'm, I've, I've talked to very briefly with Mr. Amodio and, and uh, Finance Chairman Don Hammond about this as to what format we, we want to do. But uh, I think it might be a good idea to uh, ask Mr. Amodio to go over the budget before it goes to council, what's in, what's out, what the changes are, that type of thing. So I'm still working on that, but tentatively it's going to be July 10th. And I'll work with Alderman Carlson on the start time of that meeting. If he has, if he's having a PPNS meeting that night, we'll, I'll check with him and see how long he thinks it's going to last, and we'll start the meeting accordingly. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Or so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.